David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. Or uh, okay morning, or a mournful morning. I don't know what I'm supposed to say in order to not get in trouble with the uh, conservative squads out there. Not that I actually care about that. I'm, of course, referring to the weekend's worth of faux outrage over uh, Vice President Kamala Harris's tweet heading into the weekend. Uh, what? What it was even she... she basically just saying enjoy the long weekend everybody not not saying you need to celebrate the deaths of troops on memorial day or anything like that even though you know functionally that ends up being what we do with much of our memorial day but you know they were just looking for something to make up about that i have an interesting thread that discusses uh, the the context of that you probably saw it over the weekend if you didn't you're in luck fantastic if you are asleep right now you're in luck as a matter of fact because you're sleeping in on your day off. Enjoy it any way you like. We will record all of this, and then you'll be able to hear it as a podcast later on. You get the idea. It is uh, Monday, May 31st, 2021. This is what I do at the beginning of a show to let you know whether or not it's live or uh, on tape from last year, although I very often will then confuse people by simply uh, replaying the old tapes and without any additional uh, uh, announcement, If I play last May 31st's tape for you, then you wake up and say, "Uh, is it Tuesday? Is it, you know, whatever. I guess last 31st would have been a Sunday, so we wouldn't have had one, but you get the idea. Anyway, uh, no, we're live. We decided to go ahead and do it live uh, just for the hell of it because uh, around here, uh, everybody's asleep, which is fine and maybe where I ought to be. But I figured, I don't know, I probably can't sleep all that late anymore. You know, I'm, I'm getting, it's, here I am, I'm at old age now. I can't sleep until, you know, well, certainly not until 11 at any rate. And everybody else is uh, snoozing, so it's nice and quiet. And uh, pretty soon, I'm sure, uh, actually, probably in all likelihood, people will start waking up and clanking around in the kitchen just to give us atmosphere, in case you were missing that. The Kegger in the Morning Radio Show is live now. This is what I've been explaining to you. Bill wants to explain it to you in his own way. Of course, KGROX bids you an adjectiveless Monday, lest the right-wing Twitterverse rain Twitter bricks down on him. It's true. They've been doing it all weekend. And, of course, uh, you, I'm sure by now have seen, for instance, uh, as Aaron Rupar did, putting side-by-side Fox News outrage tweets along with Fox News' own Memorial Day tweets, which, guess what? Yeah, don't do anything different. I believe uh, the one he had in mind was their note about the disgusting, in in capital letters, disgusting disrespect. Vice President Kamala Harris ignites outrage over misfire on Memorial Day tweet. And uh, right along side by side, I think, uh, as Aaron notes, 22 minutes later apart. I don't know. Let's see. I'm not certain. what. Yeah, 22, 22 minutes later. So now they're outraged about it. But, of course, then they follow up with cheers, Memorial Day weekend, 2021 cocktail trends. All the most respectful treatment, of course, of our troops. And uh, so we're not going to describe today as anything. It's not happy. It's not mournful. It's not anything. Please, no adjectives today. Just stay out of their way, I guess. I don't know. There's plenty to catch up on, of course. Uh, today, uh, an important day in history as well. Uh, I'm sure you have seen the last couple of weeks now, I think, leading up to to this event. I guess t- today, May 31st, is the 100th anniversary of the massacre in Greenwood in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, the uh, frequently known Interestingly enough, as Black Wall Street, uh, you know, a very prosperous part of town, uh, a lot of black owned businesses where people were doing very well for themselves. And of course, I guess white people saw that and said, well, we can't have that. We got to put a stop to it. And and um, buried for years in terms of study of it in, in history and of late having a, well, you know, I guess a deserved resurgence 
in the consciousness of Americans, which is a, a nice thing. I'm, I'm glad that they're getting recognition for it, but of course it is itself a terrible thing and it's a very difficult note to deal with. But today, actually the 100th anniversary was 1921 on this date that this happened. And what has been really educational about this, well, what's been really interesting is just sort of watching the resurgence of awareness of the event. And as usual, you know, there are a number of possible reasons for the resurgence in interest and not least among them proper, probably, particularly for people who had not had any knowledge of the event, might very well have been the, uh, was it HBO that aired the series of The Watchmen, which incorporates a retelling of this story and, and makes it a major part of the, well, the alternative universe in which this story takes place. And I think it probably caused a lot of people to to say, uh, I don't, you know, I don't quite get it. Is this part of the alternative universe of it? Or did something really happen that I, because some of these mentions in history, you know, Vietnam War actually happened, right? For instance, uh, and they went and looked it up and found out, oh my gosh, it really actually did happen. And I didn't know about it, how tragic and embarrassing, f embarrassing for me, tragic for everyone else. And uh, it, it it's grown in, or there's been an interest in it that's been growing as well, which I think is you know, it's, it's belated, but okay, we'll take it. Well deserved. As a matter of fact, over at the front page on Daily Coast, we have a story Denise Oliver Velez has got her piece up on it. The 1921 burning of Black Wall Street is finally being called what it was, a massacre. Even when you got people to be aware of what happened there, uh, there was a struggle to actually name it for what it was. And for the several years immediately following the event, and then the, the contemporaneous, as I understand it, the contemporaneous coverage of the event was such that uh, the white newspapers there basically said, well, what really happened here is there was a race riot and the, it, was, it was the black citizens that went crazy and, and murdered whites, uh, two of them, as a matter of fact. Uh, and of course... That was not the story. Okay. By the way, for those of you wondering, uh, Greg Dworkin, yes, scheduled to be here today. I think he got us all into this uh, situation in the first place by saying on Thursday, well, I'll see you on Monday, right? We're going to do a show on Monday. Yeah, yeah. So I had to agree to do that. But I think all of you appreciate it. It's nice to be together and discuss the news. And there was lots of it. But he's uh, rebooting the brand new computer today because, you know, a new computer needs to be booted a couple of times, I guess. So a few minutes behind schedule, but uh, we are awaiting his call. Oh, you know what I did today? We're trying an experiment, which, uh, let's see, uh, better make sure everything's going to work correctly. I turned down the sound, the volume of, uh, uh, well, for a couple of the applications, including Skype. So when the phone rings, I will see it pop up on the screen if everything works right. See it pop up on the screen, but we won't hear the the, the chimes and the bells, which uh, I don't know. Uh, I'll take a poll of listeners, whether you find that annoying or welcoming or you've gotten used to it now. And now it's a significant part of the show. I know for some reason it's been bothering Greg hearing the little noise that it makes when he hangs up. We'll see if I can remember to engineer that out of the show or not. But at any rate, uh, I just wanted to like sort of alert you to the fact that yes, he's coming. And I know it's usually you, those of you who are here for your Greg Dworkin fix are probably waiting impatiently for getting a hold of it. I, I will uh, just make one more note before he, I expect that he'll probably be calling soon, but I wanted to make one other note. In addition to uh, Denise Oliver Velez's coverage of the uh, Tulsa massacre, she's been uh, covering a couple of other angles and there's been a couple of other angles, I think important to include in at least the roundup, if not a fuller discussion at some point, of, well, the whole, you know, the whole thing where we massacre people. Uh, Denise had also mentioned this morning that, uh, first of all, noting for the record, we are 1,347 days past, uh, or she says, post Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. 
where she's been keeping an unflinching eye on things all this time. As we memorialize the 1921 Tulsa massacre today, I wonder how many of you were taught in school about the 1937 Ponce, I guess Ponce, right, massacre in Puerto Rico under the direction of U.S.-appointed racist Governor Blanton Winship. Sounds pretty Puerto Rican, doesn't he? Uh, Well, uh, if you haven't, uh, I suppose, for one thing, uh, it's not your fault. You went to school, you listened very attentively, and if they told you about it, great. And if they didn't, well, whose fault is that? Well, <clears throat> there's something you can do about it now, of course. You can read about the Ponce massacre in a linked article that she sends along, and I will put that in the roundup. To, but I just wanted to note for the record, one, yes, she has noted for the record that this thing has happened. Two, it will make you say, oh gosh, another one, I can't believe it. Uh, What else are they hiding from me? Which I guess brings me also to a thread that Patrick Snyder sent along our direction, oh, well, a couple of days ago on our way into the weekend. Is that right? Uh, But um, yeah, let me see if I can find his tweet that sent it along. If not, uh, I've got it here somewhere. I've got the thread itself, and I just wanted to make sure that it was actually Patrick that sent it to us. But uh, if not, uh, and you know what, now I'm, as I'm scrolling, I see he sent me another thread by the same author, and we've visited with this author before, Michael Harriet, uh, writer at the Root, senior writer, I don't want to, you know, shortchange him any, a writer at the Root who actually put together an excellent thread noting that on the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa massacre, we should acknowledge what happened in Greenwood, that's the section of Tulsa that we were talking about, uh, was not a spontaneous eruption of hatred. And I don't think anybody here is fooled into thinking that. But that's the narrative that America likes to portray. But what happened on May 31st, 1921 is an example of systemic racism. And a thread follows to prove that, uh, in which he states, first of all, we have a false notion that Tulsa was an oasis of exceptional black people. It wasn't even the most popular Black Wall Street. That's very interesting all by itself. I mean, when people bring up the term uh, now, anyway, I think of of the the, the Greenwood section of Tulsa. But uh, he says, look up the uh, I'm guessing Haiti, H A Y T I, the Haiti neighborhood in Durham. Look up Boley, Oklahoma. Look up Richmond's Black Wall Street, and uh, there's it's illustrated by his piece. At the root, noting the other black Wall Streets that were in existence and, well, probably some of them uh, wiped out as well. Some in the same way, some differently. But, uh, yes, it's uh, it's an important note in the remembrance of the Greenwood massacre to take note of the fact that there were there were other places that called themselves Black Wall Street and deservedly so Uh, other places basically wiped off the map, some by massacre, some by, uh, you know, zoning, you know, the, the, the soft hand, the velvet glove, I guess, of oppression, or, you know, destroyed for uh, interstate highways, all sorts of tales of how they were wiped off the map because you can't have successful black people around when there are white people who haven't had their slice of the pie, I guess. I don't really know what motivated all of it, but... Uh, Well, you can always say racism is at the bottom of it and be correct about that. So I'll share those links, at least, to those threads with you so you can get up to speed on the uh, various uh, angles and nuance available as if you're marking the Greenwood anniversary. Uh, I guess top spot for that one today, given that it's the 100th anniversary. Uh, You can't go wrong with starting the lesson there. All right, as I said, uh, plenty of other things to catch up with and round up for the weekend. Some of major consequence, some of less consequence, but are getting plenty of attention anyway. Uh, I guess the rebooting is taking, either the rebooting is taking longer or I've made a terrible, terrible mistake in turning down the sound <clears throat> from uh, Skype. My, my thinking is that even without the sound coming through, um, Whenever he calls, the the alert jumps up to the front of the screen on the show computer, so I would have a visual cue, but hey, maybe I won't. I guess we'll find out later. Uh, Let's see, other things happening over the weekend that deserve 
uh, attention or got some, even if it doesn't deserve attention. Uh, down in uh, Nashville, there was a minor blip as a uh, particularly strange and uh, of late, uh, I don't know, a little loopy, uh, to say the very least. A, a The owner of a hat company, a hat store called Hatworks, uh, now renamed Hateworks, I guess, down in Nashville, just, you know, had nobody around her to tell her, you know, you're you're going over the line here. Uh, been Become something of an anti-vaxxer, apparently, in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic. And uh, inspired by Marjorie Trader Green, I guess, uh, picked up on the line that uh, uh, keeping non-vaccinated people, not even keeping them out of places, but asking them to wear masks, when they enter someplace to voluntarily, you know, actually just put on a mask to keep themselves and others safe is pretty much the same thing as the Holocaust. As you know, we have been, perhaps you've been busy over this long three-day weekend bulldozing corpses into mass graves, just as I have been, because uh, we ask people to wear masks when they haven't been fully vaccinated. It is exactly the same thing. She's absolutely correct, of course. Uh, anyway, she thought a excellent addition to her line of merchandise at the hat store would be yellow stars of David as Jews were forced to wear under the German Third Reich, of course, during the Holocaust. Except hers would say, instead of saying Jew on them or Jewish, they would say uh, not vaccinated or indeed unvaccinated. I don't know exactly why the difference between the two. But anyway, uh, she took a picture of herself wearing one on her black sweater and was quite proud of herself holding the, you know, the sweater out and making sure the camera captured exactly what it was she was wearing, put it up on Facebook, and pow, there were consequences. Can you believe it? Of course, she is outraged that there having been consequences. You're all wrong, naturally, for not understanding the true nature of the holocausting of people who are being asked to wear masks. She's doubled, tripled, quadrupled down. And uh, Twitter, God love you. you. You realize she ran a business and spoke to the suppliers and vendors that uh, keep her in merchandise. And, uh, well, chief among them, of course, it's a hat, it's a hat store. Stetson, major supplier of goods there, and a couple of others were contacted over Twitter and Guess what? They didn't like it very much, and it looks like she's going to be in a bit of trouble. All right. Just thought I would make note of that because uh, I think it entered into the uh, at least the Twitter universe conscience over the weekend, and I wanted to take note of that. Uh, let's see. Other fun and interesting things to share with you. Um, I, I thought this was an interesting thread. Just uh, I, I don't know why, why it would fit in here at the moment, but uh, this is me thinking eh, maybe that computer isn't rebooting all that well, or maybe this whole idea about turning down the sound isn't such a good one. But I, I'm, I don't know. I don't see any other notes anywhere that say, "Hey, I'm trying to get through," but then I wouldn't if the computer wasn't rebooting. I can't reboot. Okay, so that note I see. That's too bad. <laughs> Uh, that's a bad feature on a new computer, Greg, but, uh, I think you know that, and, uh, I guess that's what the, the, uh, strange emoji with the frowny face and in the monocle <laughs> is supposed to tell me. Ah, uh, yes. Well, uh, I'm sorry to hear that. That sounds like the opposite of what you thought you were spending all that money on a new computer for. So, <clears throat> I will, uh. I'll leave it. I'll take charge of things myself and see if I can't uh, fill in his shoes. However, uh, if at some point, Greg, you feel like sending any of the Rafto stories that you, uh, the, the top news that you had in mind, if you will, uh, perhaps via your phone connection, we can do that. But I don't know even if you're listening, if you haven't rebooted, but if not. Uh, I have some coronavirus news to share, and maybe we'll do that first, and I'll save the other political science news for later on, and uh, maybe, uh, well, we'll see. we'll see where it takes us from there. But over the weekend, I grabbed, and uh, Greg probably likewise, grabbed this very interesting uh, 
bit of information from the Washington Post, just taking a second look at our own coronavirus pandemic problems from a slightly different angle. Um, meanwhile, around the world, I understand South Africa bracing for what it, it is experiencing is, as I think, a third wave of infections. Britain, likewise, and this very controversial in that uh, they seek to follow our lead in lifting restrictions in many states, including my own Virginia, lifting all of its uh, mitigation uh, uh, restrictions on Friday, midnight on Friday the 28th, so that we now are uh, without capacity restrictions on indoor gatherings, et cetera, et cetera, 100% uh, capacity back at restaurants, although uh, the restaurants that I have been in, I still haven't eaten in a restaurant yet, but the restaurants I've been visiting for takeout, still social, you know, still with the social distancing built in by closing particular tables. I think it actually just going to take the restaurants a lot, of time, even if they're anxious to get back to full capacity. And I'm not certain that they all are, but those that are, and I'm sure it's the majority of them, uh, also, probably uh, having a hard time keeping employees in there and they got to you know, they got to change their workers shifts and they've kind of gotten used to you know not being around so frequently or not having so many tables operating and they got to go around and take the signs off the tables and clean those tables up and there's a lot of labor involved in getting back to full capacity anyway we're going back to full capacity meanwhile uh, as i said britain also looking at possibly a third wave of infections, but determined in the government levels anyway, nonetheless, to go ahead with a reopening at the end of June. And uh, people there protesting that, uh, hey, we haven't actually made any of the metrics that were supposed to trigger this removal of restrictions. Are you sure you want to go ahead with this? Anyway, back here in the good old U.S. of A., because it's Memorial Day and we want to talk about how fantastic we are. Uh, this report from the Washington Post actually came out before Memorial Day and a alternative look at things. Basically, uh, upshot of this story is our numbers are looking good. They're dropping precipitously. The number of cases, the number of deaths, the number of hospitalizations. Uh, well, they say it right here has been declining in the United States. On May 26th, the U.S. case rate or seven-day average of new confirmed cases per 100,000 residents was lower than at any point in the past 11 months. Good, right? Well, how will the Washington Post turn it into bad news? It's important bad news. I'm not saying that they did a wrong thing here. We'll find out whether Greg thinks so at some point. Maybe Wednesday. At any rate, uh, they took a look at things, and, and now I think it's probably, you know, it makes some sense to divide the country into vaccinated and unvaccinated. And congratulations to us for reaching the point where 50% or over 50% of eligible recipients have in fact been vaccinated. I think we're, we, we recently hit, you know, 50% of adults, but now that we opened it up to kids 12 and over, I think we actually have made 50% of those 12 and over at this point as well. That's having a huge impact if you get vaccinated and it takes, you know, you get your, your full vaccination and you wait. That means two weeks after your second shot, if you got the two shot regimen, if you got the one shot regimen, two weeks after that one shot, then you're fully vaccinated. That's something that I see that people are not grasping. I do see people, you know, at the store doors saying, ah, don't have to mask if I've been vaccinated and take off the mask and go in and we later find out that they have been vaccinated a couple days prior or got their first shot or whatever and you know they they probably need to be a little bit clearer about this stuff but people need time to learn anyway uh the post piece here takes a look at well what about how's it going among the unvaccinated they're still out there and they still and i guess according to this stat might represent 50 percent of those eligible for vaccines still running around unvaccinated for various reasons. Many of them just saying, I just happen to have my appointment tomorrow. I'm unvaccinated now, but I'm getting it. And then, of course, there are the holdouts. Uh, as it turns out, I guess the long story short, it will give you the details after our first break. Um, 
the 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 long story short here is well among the vaccinated we're doing fine we're doing great and all the numbers are dropping among the unvaccinated basically people are contracting the virus uh becoming ill becoming seriously ill going to the hospital and dying at pretty much the same rate as the general population back at the peak of the virus in the United States in January. So if you're unvaccinated, basically conditions haven't changed for you. But the good news of 50% of us being vaccinated, uh, the overall numbers are dropping, but we are masking the fact that people are contracting the virus pretty much just like they used to if they're not vaccinated. And that stands to reason because it's the vaccine that protects the other 50% of us from contracting it. The, the, it it's not less virus. Uh, the virus hasn't been reduced to half of its power. It's still there. And it's now just picking low-hanging fruit wherever it finds it. And guess what? If you're not vaccinated, uh, you are low and hanging and fruit. So... You know, these are all things essentially you want to avoid if you can. And I recommend that you do do that. Uh, we'll read through the details of it and exactly what the numbers are that they found perhaps after the break. And uh, well, we'll also see whether the break brings us any further news of whether or not Greg's been able to boot the computer. And if not, I guess we will all helpfully suggest that he boot that new computer out of the house and get a different one. But, you know, I don't know. It's, uh, I guess the warranty process is going to come into play soon. And uh, who knows whether the Geek Squad will come to your house yet and fix these things. I suppose if they've all been vaccinated, it'll be perfectly safe for them to do so. But still something to get used to. Get used to this. Silence for two minutes from me. Hi, I'm Scott Anderson, the guy that writes the daily summary for this show, KGRO in the Morning. Thank you to everyone that supports this show. Many of you send donations through PayPal, Patreon, Square Cash, Radio Public, and so on. Some of you write your own essays and send them in, or read articles with your own commentary. We appreciate it. Now, some of you are listening to this and thinking, I'd like to help, but isn't there something I could do that wouldn't require money or effort? Why, yes, there is. You can just like us. On Daily Coast, they call it the recommend button. YouTube has a thumbs up. There are hearts and likes and love buttons. Tap our love button. Tap our love button every day. Share our shows and summaries on Facebook and Twitter, YouTube and iTunes, Stitcher and Amazon. Most of these places allow you to write a review, so a sentence or two would be great. Recommend us to social media or tell your friends to listen to the show. You aren't just helping us, you're helping them find their new favorite thing to listen to. You could change the world. So thank you in advance for me and everybody else in the world. All right, welcome back now to the Gay Girl in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Ah, two minutes of silence uh, on my end anyway. I don't know what got played in your ear. Maybe even a tape of me saying that you should give us money. Uh, in which case you should absolutely go ahead and do that as, uh, well, here's a, an announcement just to catch up on things. Uh, we have a, an increased pledge via Patreon to announce Heidi Jett, Joan Jett's younger sister, I gather. I don't, I'm, I'm sure that that's not the case, but, but wouldn't it be great if it was, uh, thanks to Heidi Jett for increasing her pledge. That's, uh, I appreciate that as, uh, <clears throat> as we do with all, of our patrons, uh, our Patreon patrons, I guess. Yes, and uh, those of you who are able to bump up the pledge, always appreciate Those of you who are brand new to it, welcome. We always appreciate your support. And uh, one day, uh, I don't know, uh, I hope to be able to uh, shower riches upon those who have been uh, instrumental in helping us make this show what it is. Whether that's Scott Anderson writing our summaries and now uh, uh, adding, <clears throat> pardon me, adding one of the uh, new break announcements, uh, encouraging you to do your part as a fan of the k in the Morning Show and uh, like us on all the various social media in which that option is available to you in a fantastic piece that he put together. 
uh, appropriately uh, or appropriately inappropriate and suggestive. That was excellent. I love when people adopt the uh, the, the flavor of the show for their own messages. I encourage uh, the rest of you who have been thinking about something like that. Perhaps uh, you want to give it a try. These guys just, uh, let's see, we had Gil do one. Uh, Scott did one. Just voice recording and sent it along. And I took care of any ums and ahs and breaths or awkward other noises in the editor. So we make everybody sound as good as we can. Everybody hates the sound of their own voice. Everyone who has sent me one of these things, whether it's a recorded segment for, you know, of substance on the show or one of the breaks, says, oh, gosh, I can't stand the way my voice sounds. Neither can I. Um, but that's just the way it is. Don't worry about it. It happens to everyone. We clean those up. Uh, I put the music in there. That's not something you have to worry about doing on your own either. Uh, so it's really not a, not a huge issue. Keeping it around a minute. Uh, Scott's came in a little over. Don't worry about it. We can, Sometimes I can make it fit in a minute. Sometimes I can't. Sometimes it's so good being suggestive and filthy minded that I just say another eight seconds of it is, is perfectly acceptable. It's a part of the atmosphere. So I appreciate it. And if you're thinking about it, you might uh, now might be the time. Otherwise, of course, if you can't bring yourself to do it, you can absolve yourself of that responsibility by sending money instead. We make it easy. Like the medieval popes, we will actually uh, sell you those indulgences. We have no problems with it. Um, and uh, perhaps someone will bring up a problem and then we'll feel bad about it later. How about that? That is my pledge to you. I might feel bad about some of this later, but it might be a nice thing to do. And, you know, it might be a nice thing uh, as well to be able to shower riches down upon Justice and his uh, shoestring budgeted operation at Netroots Radio always could use your help as well. And uh, it might be a, a nice thing one day if we had, if we had you know, like millions of dollars coming in. It would be fantastic. We could hire production staff. We could pay people for their segments when they pay. We could pay Greg, who's been doing this all for absolute zero for how long? And now he need, needs uh, needs to have a butler to reboot his computer, for instance. These are important things. A, a, a person who could uh, uh, feed Abby treats during the show to keep her content, that sort of thing. Uh, all right. At any rate, I mentioned to you that I was going to tell you something about COVID-19, the global pandemic that's killed hundreds of thousands around the world. Um, the unseen COVID-19 risk for unvaccinated people. I, again, will share the link to the Washington Post story with you. Uh, be warned that this is also another story that they thought needed an interactive element, which translates roughly into having to scroll a lot farther to get to the title and then the beginning of the story. You've got to scroll through some uh, graphs that move and change and uh, have some type laid over them that you will read again later if you finally get to the beginning of the story. I really, uh, I need to speak to the newspaper people about what interactivity really means. Anyway, Dan Keating and Leslie Shapiro have put this Together, the uh, again, the unseen COVID-19 risk for unvaccinated people, um, by which I think they mean the unvisualized risk, which is what they were doing in this interactive part, showing you the graphs changing uh, your prospects of getting COVID-19 if you are part of the general population and vaccinated or unvaccinated. And it's not unseen. It's not unacknowledged by many people, but we have seen it. But this visualization makes it very stark. But I can't show you the visualization. You have to look at it for yourself. I can only give you the narrative that goes with it. The country's declining COVID-19 rates represent or present. Uh, later on, they will represent them. An unrealistically optimistic perspective for half the nation. That is to say, the half that is still not vaccinated. I just note for the record, by the way, that we have moved. The editors have moved us from covid Capital C O V I D, you know, ca all caps because I don't know, it's an abbreviation for coronavirus disease to all lowercase. I think we moved briefly to capital C, but lowercase O V I D. Now we are at the all lowercase C O V I D stage of the disease. We are now well familiar with it, like an old friend, and they permit us to uh, uh, take away the capitals on all of that and address them 
in the familiar form, I guess. We would be using tu in Spanish for COVID at this point. You see what I mean? If you took like Spanish one, you know, you know, or if you speak Spanish, you're just laughing. Anyway, yeah, but at my ineptitude. Anyway, as more people receive vaccines, it was about a disease, remember? COVID-19 cases are occurring mostly in the increasingly narrow slice. How do you like that for language? Increasingly narrow, like meteoric rise, I guess. Put that in the same category. Uh, COVID-19 cases occurring mostly in the increasingly narrow slice of the unprotected population. Um, scientifically speaking, duh. And now moving on. So the Washington Post adjusted its case, death and hospitalization rates to account for that and found that in some places the virus continues to rage among those who haven't received a shot. The rosy national figures showing declining case numbers led the CDC to loosen mask recommendations two weeks ago and President Biden to advise people to take off their masks and smile. Hmm. It's problematic advice in any context, but okay. But adjustments for vaccinations show the rate among susceptible unvaccinated people is 73% higher than the standard figures being publicized. I mean, again, stands to reason, if you get the uh, uh, the immunization, you're mostly protected from contracting the disease and certainly protected from contracting serious disease, requiring hospitalization or resulting in death. Uh, but yes, uh, in other words, if you are looking at the national rate and saying, well, uh, transmissions way down, cases way down, hospitalizations way down, I'm safe, even though unvaccinated, you might even be thinking, I've heard about this whole herd immunity thing, and I was counting on that the whole time, perhaps. But with all these people vaccinated, there are fewer people around who can give it to me, since uh, vaccinated people also apparently incapable of transmitting the disease, or at least, I guess, producing the viral load that it would require to to reliably pass it on. Anyway, uh, so I'm safe. But the answer, is, the, the, the truth is, no, you're not. <laughs> because it's still around and well, you know uh, if it's accumulating particularly in aerosols even among vaccinated people just sort of uh, shedding it normally you weren't I guess shedding it at, at high enough rates one-on-one -on -one anyway to give it to anybody else but there could be plenty of people where who've been colonized by by the virus I guess uh, so as they say adjustments for the vaccination rates show that among unvaccinated people 73% higher risk of getting the disease than among those who've been uh, vaccinated. With that adjustment, the national death rate is roughly the same as it was two months ago and is barely inching down. The adjusted hospitalization rate is as high as it was three months ago. The case rate is still declining after the adjustment, and that's good news. In the United States, the current case rate for unvaccinated residents is similar to the case rate for all residents on December 31st of last year. Unvaccinated people are getting the wrong message, experts said. I mean, the message they should be getting, obviously, is go get vaccinated. But they think it's safe to take off the mask. It's not. Now, again, the message is if you're looking at the message as it's posted on the front doors of, you know, major retailers and restaurants, the message is if you are not vaccinated, it is not safe for you to take off the mask. But that's what people are apparently are opting to take away from this messaging anyway. They think it's safe to take off the mask. It's not, says Lynn Goldman, dean of the Milken Institute School of Public Health at George Washington University. Dot edu, just to make that longer. It looks like fewer numbers, looks like it's getting better, but it's not necessarily better for those who aren't vaccinated. Again, scientific term for that is duh. Now, states with high rates among unvaccinated people, they get at a very important point here. There are lots of states that say, hey, we are 70% vaccinated in our state. We're doing great. And upon further examination, you usually will find... Um, well, what it comes down to is, oh, the wealthy suburbs and other enclaves in the state are 80% vaccinated. And the poor districts, the rural districts, the uh, poor urban districts, uh, 
where and particularly where there's high minority populations and people are basically, you know, uh, finding I don't have time to take off from work to get this shot or, you know, any of these things. I'm worried about getting the shot and then having a reaction and not being able to go to work for a couple of days and getting fired because whatever the situation is, uh, you'll find that in those areas, they are 30 percent vaccinated. So on the whole, the state is 70 percent vaccinated, but there are enormous pockets of very low vaccination rates in some of these states. And and vice versa, I guess we should say some of the states where vaccine uptake is very low statewide, you'll find, well, among the wealthiest, the vaccine uptake has been pretty good, Um, which would lead to some interesting situations, especially if you're talking about like Trump supporters, like wealthy Trump supporters in some of the red states uh, denouncing the uh, vaccine and still insisting that the whole thing is a hoax, but they've magically become protected and the rest of you are just supposed to listen to them and get the virus and get sick. No thanks. So states with high rates among unvaccinated people is the first examination here. The adjusted rates in several states show the pandemic is spreading as fast among the unvaccinated as it did during the winter surge. Maine, Colorado, Rhode Island, and Washington state all have COVID-19 case spikes among the unvaccinated, with adjusted rates about double the adjusted normal national rate, rather. The adjusted rates of Wyoming, Virginia, Oregon, Florida, Michigan, Pennsylvania, for instance, are slightly lower than the highest states. Maryland, Virginia, and the District of Columbia have adjusted rates below the national average. We're also very smart people here, and we got vaccinated. In the region, however, lower vaccination rates in the black community have concentrated cases there to an extraordinary degree. Before vaccines, black people were about one-third of new COVID-19 patients in Maryland and half in D.C., which was bad enough. But in the latest data, black people are just under half of the new cases in Maryland and more than 80% of the new cases in D.C. Yikes. Uh, In other words, it's time to get out there with food trucks converted into um, vaccine trucks or whatever makes the right rounds. I don't know. Convert a good humor ice cream truck if that's what's driving around. Convert anything that's driving around. And, and, well, some of those places, nothing's driving around. Not taxis, not Ubers, not nothing. So I don't know how you get there, but we're just going to have to pack up trucks and move them there and hope that people don't say, I don't know who the hell's in this truck. I suspect them of malfeasance and I'm going to avoid them. We've got to find some ways, obviously, of getting the vaccine to people so that they don't miss work and in ways that they'll be willing to trust And I don't know what that is, and we will have to ask them. And with that work, obviously, I hope is already underway. Probably should have been for the past, you know, six months or so. But we'll take whatever we can get in terms of market penetration there. All right. So then next up, Oregon's current surge is driven in part by a COVID-19 variant known as B117. I don't know how you read that out other than that. But uh, which is 50 percent more contagious, said Tom Jean, a deputy state epidemiologist and senior health advisor in an interview. It is characterized by outbreaks traced to social gatherings with unvaccinated people and no masks. That can't be news at this point, right? They're at very high risk for infection, Jean said. Washington state officials say they are caught between applauding the optimism that comes with vaccination and warning everyone who isn't vaccinated that it's still dangerous. Things are getting safer for those who are vaccinated, the state's Secretary of Health, Umer A. Shah, told the Post. For those who are unvaccinated, they remain at risk. We have to make sure that nuanced message is getting to our community. Uh, How about states with high death rates? This is an interesting examination. In addition to cases, several states still have relatively high death rates. Coronavirus vaccines are virtually perfect in preventing deaths, so the decline in deaths nationally hides the steady COVID death rate among unvaccinated people. In case you're wondering, yes, we are approaching and maybe we probably haven't reached there today because there's a very big lull in reporting on coronavirus numbers over the 
over any weekend, and especially over this holiday weekend, which is not a happy one because of coronavirus. Uh, but uh, sort of a slowdown in the numbers over this weekend, still approaching 610,000 reported COVID-19 deaths in this country, according to world meters is pretty significant in case you hadn't noticed. But anyway, coronaviruses, uh, or rather the vaccines, as they said, virtually perfect in their record of preventing deaths. So we are masking the local unvaccinated death rates with our national vaccinated death rates or overall death rates. Michigan, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maine, Florida, Illinois, all have adjusted death rates about 50% higher than the national adjusted rate. Maryland, and these are the adjusted rates, just the unvaccinated. But Michigan, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maine, Florida, Illinois, Florida, hmm, gee whiz, why? Uh, having considerably more trouble. Maine, New Jersey, Maine, how did you get in here? I don't know. New Jersey, embarrassing, of course. Illinois, whatever. Of course, they'll say Chicago, as though that meant something. That's usually about guns. 50% higher than the national adjusted rate of just unvaccinated folks. Maryland's adjusted death rate is above the national average. D.C. and Virginia are just about at the national average. Looking at the death rate is not a good measure of the current spread of the pandemic, experts said, because why? Everybody, Greg taught you. It is a, let's make it like match game 21 here. It is a blank indicator, a blank indicator. Now we play the music and everybody says, what? Well, the real answer, of course, is, you know, a lagging indicator. People dying are usually infected at least a month earlier, which means deaths don't reflect current community spread of the disease. The steady adjusted death rate, however, shows that unvaccinated people are not getting safer yet. Next up, the people most likely to end up in the hospital. Experts often point to hospitalization rates as a critical measure of the pandemic because they reflect people getting very sick and aren't dependent on how much coronavirus testing a community is doing. When current hot, you know, you don't have to have had a test to show up at a hospital sick. All right. That's why. When current hospitalizations are spread across only the unvaccinated population, D.C. and Michigan have rates uh, about twice as high as the adjusted national rate. Pennsylvania, Maryland, Florida, Rhode Island. Again, Rhode Island keeps showing up in these things. Not sure why. Have rates about 50 percent higher than the adjusted national hospitalization rate. Virginia's adjusted rate is below the national average. Uh, and I guess maybe the difference, uh, again, is Virginia has a tremendous population of high income, high education. It's, it's the federal government being in, in Washington, D.C., uh, and many of the federal employees living in D.C., Maryland, close in Maryland, close in Virginia, that, that does that. Um, I've read somewhere, you know, like in economic development literature, that Northern Virginia has this uh, incredible rate of um, educational outcomes, just in terms of the, the people living here, the more PhDs and, and advanced uh, degrees, because it's a way of people to advance up the ranks very often in their federal jobs or as jobs as contractors to the federal government to go and get an MBA or even you know, if you're in the sciences or whatever, moving up into PhD level, uh, it's a, it's an advancement technique. And so there's an awful lot of education here and our education, I guess, apparently coordinating with the willingness to, uh, believe the science and get vaccinated and want to live because you're living a relatively nice life. Whereas I suppose, uh, that's not the case everywhere. Let's say that anyway. Um, I don't know what's up in Rhode Island with that, though. Still, uh, Virginia's adjusted rate, as we mentioned, below the national average. A D.C. spokesperson said the rate could be affected by out-of-state residents in local hospitals. That's very easy in this area where uh, states border like that or major metropolitan areas range over uh, two states and the district. Unvaccinated young adults in Maryland have the same infection in rate as they had in the January surge, according to a state analysis. Even worse, 
The risk of hospitalization among the infected has more than doubled, possibly because of widespread coronavirus variants, said Ted Delbridge, executive director of the Maryland Institute for Emergency Medical Services Systems. Washington State has been publicizing the extreme threat of hospitalization for unvaccinated people. It said unvaccinated seniors are 11 times as likely to get hospitalized, I guess more likely, to get hospitalized than seniors who got the shot. For unvaccinated people ages 45 to 64, the chance of COVID-19 hospitalization is 18 times higher. Wow, even higher than the elderly. Shah, the state secretary of health, worries people are being left behind while others feel the pandemic is past. I hope this has not become a tale of two societies, he said. The people who are vaccinated and are protected can resume their lives taking off their masks. The people who are not vaccinated are the ones who are not wearing a mask or washing their hands. That's bad. Those who are those are the very people who oftentimes will socialize and be around similar like-minded people. You're going to have the pandemic continue in those clusters. I mean, it's kind of obvious, but, you know, it was worth reminding ourselves uh, what the national rates may be masking and uh, no pun intended with the reference to masking there, but uh, well worth pointing those things out. I guess I have another bit here somewhere, if I can just find it, that uh, I was reminded of when reading through this. I feel certain that I have actually put this away, but uh, why... Ah, yes, that's right. Uh, my, my wife had read this over the weekend and sent it to me, and now I remember her comment on it. This, uh, we'll see if we can cram this in before the next break. From the New York Times, the headline, Like a Dream, Latin Americans Head to U.S. for COVID Shots. Uh, rich ones, that is. Frustrated with the lagging pace of vaccinations at home, well-off Latin Americans have been flying north for a shot and feeling guilty about those left behind. And I can understand that feeling of guilt, but um, hopefully there, it, it's still the case, of course, that getting shots in arms is a good thing. And for them to return to their home country and resume their lives immunized means there are just fewer places for high levels of the virus to incubate and be passed on from. And I hope that that will help lower the case count in some of these harder hit areas. Uh, in terms of just a, a programming note from my own observations and my nightly tweets about these things, the concentration uh, among the top 10 countries in the world in terms of new cases reported, not yesterday, but the day before yesterday, you know, day by day, new cases day by day per uh, million in population very highly concentrated in South America right now. It has been for some time, but it's been spreading. Of course, Brazil was always a problem. And then of late, uh, Argentina blossomed into a problem, as did Colombia. But it's now spread to Uruguay, uh, Paraguay, uh, Chile. Uh, just it's it's everywhere. I mean, well, you know, the rest of South uh, America and and getting up into the uh, well, I, what was this? The the shield area, as I, I think they call it, uh, above um, Brazil, where Guiana and French Guiana and Suriname are, and they are showing up. French Guiana, are very early on, had a huge surge in the virus. Uh, not so much of late, but Suriname now replacing them. So it's it's become quite an issue, let's say. Uh, and uh, outside of South America, the other nations in the top 10, there were only three of them and all, almost all micro states. Malaysia being the largest, uh, not a micro state, but uh, Bahrain and uh, Maldives uh, showing up at the top of the list for whatever reason. Okay, so now down to uh, this story about basically vaccine tourism. Uh, where do you think the folks from Latin America might be flying into in order to uh, one, uh, get into the country easiest, and two, get access to COVID vaccines, which are pretty tightly controlled in some places. Um, but to, to have easier access to it, they're flying, of course, to Miami, major international airport hub, and, of course, part of 
wild and woolly Florida, where the governor uh, seems intent on doing everything he can to adopt the Trumpiest possible positions on all this stuff. But it was very early on uh, loosening restrictions on who could get the vaccine in Florida, where other governors took more conservative approaches and said, you can sign up through a state system and come and get these things, make appointments. Uh, Florida did away in many cases with the appointments and scheduling very early and where other states were very early on controlling the distribution of the vaccine by age and trying to get the elderly population vaccinated first because they seem to be the most vulnerable. They removed their age restrictions very early. And then we got early reports of American domestic vaccine tourism places, people in states where they were not yet eligible to receive the vaccine were traveling to Florida. And I don't know whether they even ask whether you're a Florida resident at the vaccine centers. They, if you show up and again, not such a bad idea, right? There's a theory under which getting shots into arms is a good thing, no matter what, even if you're jumping in line. So it wasn't necessarily the worst thing in the world. Now, though, it raises this interesting question. I'm going to read through the rest of this article. We'll save it for after the break, perhaps, just to get the details of it. But my wife's question in all of this, if you're that loose with handing out the vaccine, and, and it's, again, maybe a good thing, maybe not. Uh, it, it certainly, you know, doesn't have to be a horrible thing. There's plenty of other horrible things that Ron DeSantis has been doing. We can discuss those perhaps after the break, too. But it does raise this question. Uh, you know, he's been relatively boastful about the number of vaccines that Florida has administered and held up against the other states. They have a fairly good record of passing out these vaccines. But now we realize um, how many uh, what we don't do, because most of the states have been tightly controlling their shots. It's been assumed that the shots that they were giving out, shots that they were administering, were being administered to residents of that state. What we now realize is it may be the case that Florida has given out X number of vaccines, but how many of the people in Florida have actually been vaccinated? Question mark. All right, welcome back now to the Get Going in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Ah, let's talk about what's going on here with the um, vaccine tourism, the Latin American, the well-off Latin Americans heading to the U.S. for COVID shots. Can't blame you. And what the hell? Come on in, really. Honestly, we should be shipping the shots to you. Uh, not fair that the wealthiest are getting them first. That's obviously an issue. Uh, but again, you know, at some level, I think getting shots into arms is is I, has got to be helpful on some level. Uh, we could be more helpful if we went there and vaccinated people who couldn't afford to come here. But this is the reality. But this also raises some interesting questions about what's going on in Florida. Maybe it's not all in Florida. Let's see. Uh, the story reported in the New York Times by Ernesto Lodonio, uh, Daniel Politi, and Santi Car Carneri, Carneri uh, if I've got that right, and datelined in Rio, Florencia Gonzalez Alzaga, a photographer from Buenos Aires, uh, hatched her plan to fly to the United States for a coronavirus vaccine after the subject came up in her Zoom book club. Juan Pablo Bojaca, a Instagram influencer from Colombia, boy, oh boy, who specializes in frugal travel, uh -huh, urged his 137,000 followers to give it a try, posting a step-by-step -step video guide that showed him clearing passport control in Miami. All right, that's helpful, I guess. I mean, I guess... You still have to have a minimum amount of money to be able to do these things, but at least he's trying to help other people get there. Uh, Jose Acevedo, a real estate agent in Paraguay, was stunned by how easy the whole thing was in Las Vegas. How about that? I hadn't thought about that as a destination. Frustrated with the lagging pace of vaccine campaigns at home and seeing a surplus of doses in the United States. True, right? It's okay with me. Where tens of millions of Americans have opted not to get inoculated. You know, I'm for saving smart Latin Americans faster than dumb Americans, I guess. I look, I favor the smart. 
or in this case, the wealthy. Uh, that I think is uh, perhaps less acceptable. <laughs> Obviously, I favor rescuing the wealthy. But look, if you can get here and you can get the virus, I'm not going to deny it to you. That's the bottom line. I don't think that makes any sense for anybody. Um, if there was a way to say, here's 10 more, take them home with you and give them to qualified medical personnel for them to administer and to believe that they would be then delivered to low income people, that would be great. I don't know if that's where they would end up. But again, if they get in arms, they get in arms. But that wouldn't be a perfectly responsible way of distributing anything. But I don't know. I'm just <clears throat> thinking. I wish there was a way to, you know, distribute some of our surplus a little more quickly. Anyway, um, what can I tell you? Frustrated with the lagging pace of vaccine campaigns at home and seeing a surplus in the United States, right? Uh, wealthy and middle-class Latin Americans with American tourist visas, anyway, have been flocking to the United States in recent weeks to score a COVID-19 shot. It's like a dream, said Ms. Gonzalez, who got her shot in Miami in April. The access has provided a bonanza for the privileged in countries where the virus continues to take a brutal toll, even if many, including those who are benefiting, struggle with the fact that vaccine tourism exacerbates the inequality that has worsened the pandemic's toll. Sean Simons, a spokesman for the One campaign, which works to eradicate disease and poverty, said vaccine travel could have serious unintended consequences and urged nations with vaccine surpluses to funnel them instead through a World Health Organization vaccine distribution system known as COVAX. Millionaires and billionaires traveling across continents or oceans to get a vaccine, usually twice, means greater exposure, higher likelihood of variants spreading, uh, and access only for the most elite, he said. That part we knew. But the first two, good points. The Biden administration said this month that it would give 80 million vaccine doses by the end of June to countries that are scrambling to vaccinate their people. And guess what? Even more important than all of this is that Greg's computer has actually rebooted. So that's good news. And uh, let's see, requesting permission to call in, essentially. And uh, let's give a thumbs up to that and say, yes, we'll accept uh, his uh, 10 o'clock hour contributions. And maybe everything is uh, in order to go ahead and do that since it's a holiday and uh, he has not got elsewhere to go. I turned the sound back up thinking that I had somehow jinxed things uh, before. And then uh, lo and behold, when I did turn the sound back up, uh, the computer rebooted. So I guess that does have something to do with it there. It's obviously a cause and effect relationship. Good morning, Greg. How are you? Uh, good morning. So I've been having some uh, computer rebooting problems. Yeah. Well, the, what size boot does it wear? <laughs> it's, you didn't uh, find that out. That's uh, the problem. It's, uh, my shoes uh, just don't fit, you know? Mm-hmm. I, I can't possibly feel it. Reshoe a so. horse and reboot a computer. Something like that. All right. Uh, but, you know, here we are uh, with a couple of frantic calls to the uh, Apple uh, folks who were very, ah. very good over the phone about walking me through zapping prams and oh, uh, uh, restarting a whole bunch of other acronyms I can't even remember anymore. Hmm. Uh, well, but it's working. Good. That's nice to know. And Apple at that, it's not really great publicity for them. But hey. No, you well, do? you know, when something goes wrong, they help you. So that, that part That's is good. That's good. Good publicity. And they were uh, even on this Memorial Day, which we Thank should you, acknowledge. Uh, you know, I see all this uh, flap about uh, things that uh, Kamala Harris said. Mm -hmm. uh, right. And uh, what's so weird is she said something about have a have a happy long weekend. And, and folks were weekend, yeah. uh, uh, pseudo outraged yes. about the fact uh, that uh, uh, she didn't uh, properly respect uh, the whole reason why Memorial Day was there, uh, you Jesus, know, forgetting about the fact that the former guy called uh, everybody who died in wars losers and and uh, uh, so on and so forth, not right. the same outrage. But the other side of the coin is that the very same people who were complaining about it, generally, <laughs> a lot of them could be found to have tweets, which you could look up on online, which said things like, have a nice long weekend. Yes, or happy As holidays. being polite is somehow or other not polite. And yeah. obviously, uh, you know, to me, the reason that this is happening is because, uh, you know, she's a black female. Yes, that is definitely uh, chief among them. Because uh, I think, actually, President Biden tweeted something 
you know, or had tweeted on his behalf anyway, the, uh, a similar sentiment. And I don't know, no one was outraged about that one, but, uh, they, I, hers was first. They jumped on it first. Uh, I do have a thread somewhere that, that I thought explained things very well, but, uh, we'll get to that later on. Mm. So, uh, you know, I think the big news, uh, outside of, of that and the usual news, Yes. You know, the pandemic and uh, January 6th not going away. And, and uh, uh, of course, uh, Democrats walking out in the uh, Texas yes, legislature, yes. Uh, 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 at least temporarily preventing a very uh, ridiculously uh, restrictive voting bill to be passed because now they don't yeah. have a quorum. Right. right. Uh, but uh, the government threatens to call a special session. It's just that you can't do you can't sneak it in anymore. Yes, uh, that was the main thing. Not only was it a very repressive, uh, well, voter suppression bill, but they aimed to do it overnight on the weekend and minimize attention to it, including, I think, throwing right. reporters out. And one of the things out. they did was, was block uh, overnight and weekend voting. <laughs> yes, while they voted overnight. While and they on the voted weekends. overnight yeah. and on the weekend. That Because, of course, overnight and weekend voting is rife with fraud, which is why you had which, to walk out. Right about because that, clearly it is. Yeah, at least when they do it, it is. So, right. you know, projection. But, again. Uh, the, the big news that, that I've been trying to follow, because it's oh. almost impossible, is uh, what's going on with uh, Israeli elections. Oh, well, elections. Like that. <laughs> They're not having an election. That's right. They're still trying to work out the last one. Yeah. Which is like the last four tip. or so before it. The thing is that uh, Bibi Netanyahu couldn't form a government, so uh, it turns out Naftali Bennett How is government and form? Yair Lapid may uh, uh, do a, a center-left-right coalition to That's kick all... Netanyahu out, and he's furious about it. Center-left-right. Yeah. Well, Naftali Bennett is a right. See, one of the very dumb things I heard over the weekend hmm. is a very lazy Tom Friedman say something about... Well, you know, uh, uh, Bibi Netanyahu is uh, Israel's Trump, and so what's happening is Israel's becoming Bidenized. Hmm. Yes. Uh, which, and nothing hmm. could be further from the truth. Then I meant no. Uh, what's happening is uh, that since, I don't know, 77, 1978, something like that, the right wing plus religious parties have basically run Israel. Okay. And it's why, uh, for example, uh, ultra-Orthodox uh, uh, kids don't have to serve in the army, whereas everybody else does. It's one example. Okay. Um, one of the things they do for themselves. So they are the people that have supported the settlers plus uh, uh, the ultra-Orthodox have supported uh, uh, Netanyahu. He's their guy. I guess so. And they haven't backed off from him, but their allies have. Because he's basically thrown each one of his erstwhile allies in order to cobble together a government under the bus at some point. And so they've had it with him. So the reason Netanyahu won't be the next prime minister as of next week mm -hmm. yeah. is his right wing allies have deserted him. Ah. That's not the Bidenization of Israel by any stretch. No, I would think not. It's 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 a ridiculous comparison. And uh, I'm giving you a layman's description of what's going on in Israel because it's way too complicated for anybody truly except an expert. Mm. That's why I'm trying to read the Israeli papers and try to get a sense of what's going on. Uh, here's Haaretz today, for example. Two days before deadline, Lapid says Israel can enter a new era without Netanyahu. Yer Lapid has looked like a statesman, Naftali Bennett, whose career on the right appeared to be over, but he's a secular rightist. So the other okay. Orthodox don't like him, and he doesn't get along with them. So those parties won't align with him. All right. Um, has also, uh, you know, done some remarkable uh, uh, statesmanship in terms of giving up things, uh, Lapid in particular, uh, because they're going to apparently have a rotating uh, uh, prime ministership here, and uh, Lapid has given up the opportunity to be prime mm -hmm. minister in order to make sure that Netanyahu's out. Okay. And so this is more about getting rid of Netanyahu than it is changing Israeli society. Oh. All right. I mean, it might it may end up the same society, but just without him. Uh, so here's another article from Haaretz. Uh, Netanyahu is bankrupt, and everyone in the business of politics knows it. I mean, that's probably really more to the point hmm. in terms of what's going on here. Okay. Uh, the man who introduced fraud and deception into Israel's political lexicon accused Bennett, Naftali Bennett, <laughs> of cheating his voters. 
Mm-hmm. That is to say, when Naftali Bennett ran and didn't get very many votes, uh, he realized, Bennett did, that uh, you know taking an ultra hard line against Palestinians wasn't the ticket to uh, do better with the electorate. It was actually you know trying to improve the economy and you know doing the bread and butter kind of stuff. Hmm. Okay. And uh, so, at some point, everybody has said something. So at some point, I think he said he would not align with the left at all in order to do anything and uh you know netanyahu forced him to and so now uh netanyahu is accusing him of cheating his voters but uh you know uh, let's let's just read from this piece a little bit because i think it's pretty good netanyahu ought to ask himself how is it when he stood on the virtual street corner and offered the premiership to every passerby nobody took it (laughs) Gideon Saar, Naftali Bennett, Benny Gantz, Yair Lapid, all received generous offers, astonishing, as Netanyahu put it, but they all laughed in his face or in those of his envoys. <laughs> the problem wasn't the offers. They were indeed fantastic. The problem was the person making them. Hmm. To borrow from economic jargon, Netanyahu is bankrupt, radioactive. Aside from the ultra-Orthodox and the racist right, which still cling to him, none of our political leaders are interested in doing business with him. His promises and agreements are worthless. His word isn't his bond. The man who introduced fraud and deception into Israel's uh, Israel's uh, political lexicon excoriated Bennett Sunday night, accusing him of cheating his voters because he violated his promise not to join a government with Lapid. He signed the document, shouted the saint in the prime minister's office who rode roughshod over the coalition agreement he signed uh, before the ink was even dry. Hmm. Then he had uh, a prime time speech and basically lost it and started yelling at everybody. Uh, and that's where things stand. So, you know, welcome to Israeli politics. Okay. Well, some of that stuff is Trumpy, but not all of it. Uh, a lot of it is Trumpy. So, uh, yeah, we, we get that part. Uh, and then he went on to make the case that, uh, oh, the Iranians must be delighted with this because basically only I can stop the Iranians from whatever, getting a nuclear weapon, taking over the world, whatever it is he, he thinks he's the only person. Winning Eurovision can do and then excoriated biden uh and saying he's just like these he's just like the iranians no good you know uh only i and it just it, it's all uh personal uh cult sort of stuff uh a lot of it driven by the fact that once he's out of office then uh you know he gets to uh continue his corruption trial mm, ah yeah that's trumpy too that's Trumpy, too. So, you know, as far as that goes, uh, you know, th- that is uh, a big news and probably uh, not well enough covered here in the United States, but certainly well worth uh, watching. Okay. Uh, over in Germany, by the way, speaking of international news, the uh, Green Party candidate for the uh, uh, replacement of uh, Angela Merkel is actually doing very well. Oh. So that's something to keep an eye on as well. All so right. uh, a lot going on around the world. And, uh, you know, certainly uh, we, we tend to focus on domestic politics, not just yes. on the show, but uh, when I write it at, about uh, politics on Daily Coast and in, in general, uh, we tend to focus on domestic politics. But uh, these are a couple of stories that I think are just well worth, uh, you know, keeping uh, keeping on your radar. OK, uh, then you won't be surprised when things come up. I'm willing to do this. Good. So I got a story for you. OK. And uh, I'll probably. Uh, uh, Stick with you through the 1030 hour and then uh, make some uh, final configurations on my newly working computer. Excellent. All right. Uh, This one is from CNN, Harry Enten, and talks about a topic that we've talked about on the show a lot. And it's just so interesting uh, to see it get covered this way. Biden is getting a big bounce with Hispanics, says the article. All right. Okay. Hispanic voters were one of President Joe Biden's biggest weaknesses in the 2020 election, although sources differ on his margin. Biden's advantage with Hispanics was the worst for a Democratic presidential nominee since 2004, even as he had the strongest performance overall for a Democrat since 2008. Now, he did well overall with Hispanics, just not as well as expected and certainly not as well in certain places like South Texas and South Florida. Right. We talked about that on the show a lot. And, of course, the question is why? A look at recent history and polling reveals, however, uh, writes Harry Anton, that Biden may be primed for a comeback among Hispanics for a simple reason. He is now the incumbent. Take a look at Gallup polling during the Biden presidency. Aggregating all the polls it has conducted so far in order to get a large sample size, Biden's approval rating with Hispanics stands at 72 percent compared to 55 percent overall. 
And by the way, 55% isn't bad in this hyperpolarized environment. Yes, right. Okay. That 72% is a clear improvement from how Biden did in the election with Hispanics. Biden won 65% of Hispanics, according to network exit polls. Estimate from the Democratic firm Catalyst, which lines up well with what we saw in pre-election polls, had Biden taking 61% of Hispanics. So this Gallup poll suggests Biden's support may be up anywhere from 7 to 11 points since the election. Okay. Okay. Yes. And he's had a disproportionate rise in support from Hispanics. And uh, the 20 point gap between how Hispanics and adults overall feel about Biden is wider than the last Democratic president saw in his first months on the job. And the question is why? And there's a couple of things. One is that Hispanics, uh, in polling at least, tend to favor incumbents. Interesting. And now Biden is the incumbent. So it's a small C conservative way of looking at politics. You know, I generally go with the guy who's there. Hmm. And incumbency does, in fact, uh, have that. And there's also speculation, which I found interesting, not in this article, but uh, online people reacting to it, that uh, a lot of this had to do with the fact with uh, Hispanic, Latino, Latinx voters uh, thinking Trump was more likely to open up the economy than Biden was during the pandemic when they felt like their number one issue was putting food on the table. Hmm. And that's something we talked about extensively on the show. Yes. And then they found out that, uh, hey, the economy is opening. Yes. Okay. So now that the economy is opening under Biden, uh, he's getting points for it, in other words. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's it's interesting. That. And that may mean that uh, should he uh, run again, and of course, it's too early to know and probably too early that you don't want to focus on it, uh, mm. then, uh, you know, he may well uh, be in a much stronger position than he was when he won, which is not surprising. Sometimes incumbents do pretty well the second time around. Sometimes they don't, like in George H.W. Bush's case. Mm-hmm. Uh, it all depends on circumstance. And that's why people who, quote, know what's going on uh, are to be uh, looked at with, you know, perhaps a, a, a grain of uh, sea salt. Oh, you know, the fancy. same people who told you that uh, Netanyahu is going to be helped by the recent uh, troubles there, because everybody knows that that's the case, no. uh, may not be correct. All right. I'm, I'm prepared for them to be wrong. Mm. Uh, those same people are telling you that, no, of course, no. everybody's going to bury what happened on January 6th, because that's the way Republicans roll. I know they want to. But they again, do. I have to remind you that a lot of the reporters who cover this stuff were in the building. And because they were in the building... Uh, they are not going to let it go so easy. And the fact that there were uh, Capitol Police officers who were bringing it up to the Republicans and upset that they didn't pass this uh, January 6th commission and the fact Mm -hmm. that Nancy Pelosi is the speaker and has her own ideas on how things should be done and has lots of options left in terms of looking at January 6th, even if it's not the commission style. Uh, which in itself has its flaws, mind you. Just everybody felt on balance it was the best way to do it. But it's what I'm saying is that it's not the only way to do it. Okay. And and I'll the agree. idea that uh, suddenly all of this uh, looking at January 6th is going to come to a halt because the Republicans want mm-hmm. to protect Trump and yet move on and pretend it's not a campaign issue. Every Democrat is going to run on the fact that uh, you protected Trump and you're trying to cover it up. And so it's going to absolutely be a campaign issue. Yes. And uh, hopefully more than just that. But yeah, that is uh, that is true. We, we, we have some dissecting of the occurrences on Friday yet to do. We haven't discussed the process by which uh, things were blocked. I mean, there was more to it than just the fact that it was filibustered. But uh, attendance had a great deal to do with how things went on Friday and and uh, brought up some real interesting possibilities for things in the future. In terms of how you might reform uh, the vote, you mean? Yes. Um, as a matter of fact, that it just... It just that, that would be your wheelhouse. Yeah. As it happens, um, uh, people took notice of this, and uh, credit, I think, to Brian Boitler for pointing out the the gap in things. I saw that 89 votes were cast in the... Uh, I think that was the right number. 89 votes cast in the uh in the senate on the question of cloture on you know whether or not to move forward the debate on the january 6th commission bill that's where we were formally it was just a cloture vote and uh though there were 54 votes 
in favor of cloture. You know, we all know that it takes 60 and that it takes 60 affirmatively, 60 to do it. It's not just 60 percent of those present and voting. We went over, I think, in the past about 100 times why that is, that it requires now uh, three-fifths of the senators duly chosen and sworn to vote in favor of cloture. And that's 60 at a minimum. But uh, the vote, having been delayed by Ron Johnson's antics, fell on a Friday and, of course, a holiday weekend Friday. And people were doing the absolute wrong thing, getting ready to enjoy their weekends and leave. And uh, I guess a bunch of people left the Senate behind, including a lot of criticism for uh, Kirsten Cinema. Who says and Patty she, Murray, who yeah, are the two Democrats, who say they would have voted in favor of cloture, but then but other of course, people push cinema back. got more uh, uh, grief because yes. you know because people are mad at cinema, right? Just the same way uh, Harris got more grief than anybody else because people want to be mad at Harris. Yes, that's true, and uh, you know others pointing out, well, you know, even if they had been there, there would have been fifty-six votes in favor of cloture, and that still doesn't invoke cloture. 57, well, because Pat Toomey uh, missed it and oh, said, yes. I would have voted for it. Right, that too. And so there was a, there was an opportunity also to capitalize on the uh, small but somewhat significant, uh, politically symbolic at least, number of Republicans willing to vote for cloture to get this thing forward and, and then presumably pass the bill. But still 57 um, as opposed to the 60 that was needed. So there's, that's one issue. But another was that there were... Well, and, and I think it was Norm Ornstein who, who said, you know, what you really have to do is make it so you need 41 no votes, not 60 yeah. yes votes or whatever. Right. That's one uh, suggestion. Sure. There were only and 37, so it would have passed. Uh, right. The other thing that got pointed out was there were nine Republicans missing, and they were missing because they knew that there weren't 60 votes to be collected uh, whether they were there or not. So in other words, uh, the, you know, the very painless way that filibustering now takes place, you, you know, just say we're going to block the bill. And then if they have a cloture vote, so long as you know that the uh, proponents of a bill can't gather 60, there's no job for you to do. There's no, you know, Mr. Smith goes to Washington situation. Uh, and people have been saying, oh, well, we need to have a talking filibuster so that we can force this thing. One of the things we might need to enforce is that if we can't get to a talking filibuster, we should at least have a yes, you have to stay here and vote filibuster. Uh, one way of doing it is, uh, as Norm Ornstein suggested, changing the rules, but changing the rules still requires holding one of these votes on the nuclear option. But one of the things that happened with the numbers on Friday with nine Republicans missing, uh, you had an opportunity there to say, well, look, uh, someone could have stood and done this and, and said 54 votes in favor of cloture, 39 votes against cloture. Now, I'm aware of what the current interpretation of the rules is, but I appeal the ruling of the chair that cloture has not been invoked. You say it hasn't been invoked because it requires 60 votes, a three-fifths of the Senate duly chosen and sworn voting in the affirmative on the question of cloture. I say it really only requires a majority, just like it does for nominations. I appeal the ruling of the chair. The chair would have said, oh, I'm sorry, but that's the way the rule actually works right now. And I might have then said, yes, but I have, if not 54 people willing to do it, 47 people willing to do it, minus Kirsten Cinema, who took off, minus Patty, uh, she wasn't going to do it anyway, Patty Murray, who might have voted with us, but who is gone, uh, and minus uh, Joe Manchin, who's here and will certainly vote no, I can still put together 47 votes. However, among the Republicans, I can only put together 42 no votes. And to change the rules via the nuclear option, we all think of, well, you only need 50 plus the vice president. Well, what you if need... If everybody's there. Right. If everybody's there. What you need is a majority. That's it. There's no rule about how many have to be duly chosen and sworn. It's, it's present so and voting. So you're saying that because they left, you could have changed the rules where they were gone. Yes. And now that's one of those things that's not done in the Senate, but so is filibustering the January 6th commission, if you ask me. And they could have done this. It could have been reversed later on, uh, right, but it right. would have made a great point and would have meant that in the future when there's a cloture vote coming, 
yes, you all have to stick around and cast your vote on this thing, or I might do this. I would start threatening to to uh, to uh, appeal the ruling of the chair every time one of these things happens. Right. And, the downside, and of course, is pissing right? off uh, Mansion and Cinema yeah. and making uh, Chuck Schumer look like a uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, insisting that you yeah, you so have they'll a beg you not to everything. do it. So it's risky. Yeah, they'll beg you not to do it, but you don't even have to do it. In order, uh, just say, look, I'm doing it just so that people stick around. Yeah. And what's wrong with that? So I don't know. Well, we're gonna take a two-minute break. If you've got more, you're certainly welcome to stay. Just Otherwise, a tiny bit more. Okay. Hi, it's me, David Goldman, your host for KGRO in the Morning. I have good news to report. Many more listeners like you are making critical contributions that keep our show on the air. Makes good sense, of course, and Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it simple. Now you can make easy, secure, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. Maybe you'd like to thank us for helping keep you sane during the Trump era. Maybe you're looking forward to in-depth explanations of what's going on in the Biden administration. Whatever it is that keeps you listening, we need your help to keep bringing it to you. And hey, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running with those options too. Thanks again, everyone, for all of your support. We literally could not do this without you. Welcome back now to the KGO in the Morning Show here on Edwards Radio. Greg Dworkin still with us for just a moment. A few fine points he wanted to put on his presentation for today. What's, uh, what's well, still I, on your I was mind? struck by some of the reaction from Republicans yes. about the January 6th commission, which I thought were pretty telling. You know, one of, one of the interesting things is that the old style Republicans, like uh, uh, Pat Toomey, uh, for example, uh, who didn't vote for it, but said he would have, he could have stayed silent. So he didn't use not being there as a uh, way to cloak what his intentions were, right, at okay. least uh, directly. Rob Portman voted for it. Uh, you know, uh, Romney, some of the old style folks that you'd expect to vote for it, uh, voted for it. And some of the, uh, shall we say, more uh, colorful uh, Republicans who voted for it were rather upset with what was going on. Okay. Oh. Uh, the first one I want to highlight is Lisa Murkowski ah. who delivered uh, basically uh, Liz Cheney style pointed remarks about oh. her fellow Republicans. Okay. She told reporters that the decision facing senators about more than just one election cycle. Uh, she said they don't want to rock the boat. Republican senators who oppose the commission. They don't want to upset but again, it's important there be a focus on the facts and the truth, and that may be unsettling, but we need to understand that. Okay. And asked whether she's concerned that voting in favor of the panel might doom her own reelection. She said, I can't think about that. She said the choice facing Congress is about more than one election. To be making a decision for the short term political gain at the expense of understanding and acknowledging what was in front of us on January 6th, I think we need to look at that critically. Is that really what this is about? Is everything just one election cycle after another? That's pretty much directed at Mitch McConnell. Mm. Okay. Now, uh, good. Right. And right after the attack, uh, she said, I want him to resign. I want him out. He's caused enough damage uh, talking about Trump. So she was one of the vote to convict. So, you know, hers is fairly straightforward. I think in many ways, one of the interesting reactions is that uh, Susan Collins was also very upset that the vote didn't go her way. She had tried to make some uh, changes to staffing some minor tweaks uh, that perhaps oh, would uh, yeah. attract a few more Republicans. Were they actually and uh, Chuck tweets? Schumer wasn't nice to her. And so she was terribly upset, but she was upset at Chuck Schumer. <laughs> As if her mild, uh, minor tweaks were important in any way, shape, or form in terms of how people voted. Hmm. And I looked at that and I said, that's weird. Why would she blame Chuck Schumer? I mean, I get that she's a Republican, so you have to blame somebody. But mm -hmm. as I was looking up, uh, you know, the quote or quotes that she had about blaming Schumer uh, directly after the January 6th vote, I came across none of that. I came across a whole bunch of stuff from March 10th, 2021. 
which I thought was pretty interesting and puts in context why she's blaming Chuck Schumer. Hmm. Because okay. on March 10th, 2021, an apparently decade old feud between Schumer and Collins it was festering, according to this New York One article. Schumer says hmm. working with Collins in the past was a mistake. And the main senator calls the comments bizarre. Uh, uh, this is an interview that Schumer had with Anderson Cooper. Could Democrats have done more to gain some GOP support for Biden's COVID package? The bill passed. Yeah. Uh, Senate with a 50-49 party line vote. And this was right before it was approved by the House and then signed. And Schumer said, no, we made a big mistake in 2009 and 2010. Susan Collins was part of the mistake. We cut yeah. back on the stimulus dramatically and we stayed in recession for five years. And okay. so Many people Collins think got so. upset about that. But Collins and Schumer have been fighting for years, apparently. They don't like each other. And so naturally, when the uh, uh, the the uh, uh, request that the, a commission be created failed, mm -hmm. whatever the technical language is for it, uh, she blamed Schumer. Sure, why not? Uh, Even okay. though the problem is her fellow Republicans. Yeah. Who would not have gone along with it, even had she and, and she did. Schumer gave uh, uh, Collins what she wanted in terms. Uh, this is one of those, you know, Murkowski gets what there. she wants and then votes. No, uh, Collins got what she wanted in terms of the staffing issue. But when Schumer brought the uh, question to a vote. He said Republicans are blocking it and you're not looking very good. And she got very upset that Republicans are called out for voting no, which, in fact, is appropriate because they all voted no, except for those. And she's supposed to say not all Republicans and then whatever. So, so naturally, it was Chuck Schumer's fault because he actually had the nerve to get to the floor of the Senate and speak the truth. And that was right. very upsetting. The deeply concerned she was. Deeply concerned. So okay. it's, just, it's so weird to watch the two of them vote the same, but take totally different approaches in trying to describe what's going on. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, that'll happen. Uh, right. uh, Murkowski said, my fellow Republicans are really terrible, and they're terrible people, and they didn't do this, and they should have done this, and this is so much more important than winning the next election cycle. And Collins said, I tried to be bipartisan. I went so far as to offer amendments, which the Democrats accepted, uh, I'm like Kevin McCarthy. I can't believe they accepted what I offered, and now I'm really pissed at them. <laughs> yeah, what? All right. And yeah, you so look at that, and you go, "What? What is going on here?" Yeah, I don't know. She's got an act, and that's it, I guess. It's her shtick, you know. She does it. She's got. Uh, it's she's a one-trick pony, but it works for her. And uh, you know, so again, people mean. are not so mad at Susan Collins, uh, but uh, she's trying to get them mad at Chuck Schumer because I don't know why. Just, whatever i don't know that's her that's her thing right you know she does she's uh playing both sides what an independent okay. so you know there's there's uh infrastructure that's up for debate at this particular point and again as you pointed out playing hardball with making people show up for these votes yeah uh well uh cinema and mansion still have uh the uh the tie casting vote so to speak mm -hmm. in terms of whether stuff goes through reconciliation so you got to be careful about that stuff yeah, and, well, you know, Susan Collins, frankly, doesn't matter. Yeah. So she can rant all she wants to. Uh, but Markowski's comments are the ones that are going to stick. Nobody's going to remember that Susan Collins was mad at Schumer. People yeah, are going to remember what Markowski said about uh, the Republicans under Mitch McConnell. Yeah, I think Why so. Why are they going to remember that? Again, I have to remind our listening audience. The people who report these things were in the building during January 6th, and they are not letting this go. Well, good. Nor should they. I mean, one Nor of the few. They. But uh, you know that that's remember the old adage about the uh, news is what happened right. to my editor on his way to work today or yeah. her work today. Sometimes it works in our favor, or and in, in, you know, the, our being like regular people who say, "Hey, this is an important thing," and the media is dismissing it. Well, good. Not this time. Not this time. So you know there'll Excellent. be sites like the Bulwark, which will keep up the uh, the information going. Uh, I found this Sahil Kapoor as we were talking, going back to uh, the original presentation about Harry Anton's uh, talk. Oh, yes. There's evidence Sahil writes that one reason Biden underperformed is many Latinos are more afraid to lose their jobs and get sick during the pandemic, and saw Trump as likelier to open the economy. Hmm. These gains are consistent with that theory. Now that things are reopening on Biden's watch, uh, but again, yeah. listeners to the show will be very familiar with that theory. Yep, because I espoused it. Oh, right. You're the espouser. 
I'm the espouser. I guess. All right. Yeah. Well, no, that does make sense. And it is consistent with the same idea. Uh, it, look, I was for opening the economy, uh, hopefully safely, but if necessary, unsafely. But now that I have the option to open it safely and it's opening and it's safe. Her? It. Yeah. And I love the guy that's doing it. Yeah. So a lot of that. Uh, at least there's Here's one Dan group Baltz of voters looking back and forth between these topics. Uh, the Senate vote on the bipartisan January 6th commission showed Trump's power and a government under duress. Many Republican elected officials, and uh, it's good to cite Dan Bolz because, you know, he is about as conventional wisdom as it gets. Okay. Many Republican elected officials want Trump to go away. They want him in their rearview mirrors. They want the upcoming midterms to be fought in an atmosphere free of the former president and focused on Biden. No. That's why Liz Cheney ah. has been such an irritant to GOP leaders because she refuses to turn away from what Trump's actions produced on January 6th and she fears could provoke again. Her colleagues are afraid to be more affirmative and aggressive in challenging the former president. They fear Trump. They fear his followers who now dominate the GOP rank and file, something which we don't say enough of. Uh, and so they yes. voted on Friday to protect the former president by obstructing the commission, hoping that would protect themselves next year. The vote again showed the hold that Trump has on his party. So uh, that's Dan Bolt's writing in the uh, Washington Post, which I have in the pundit roundup. And to that point, uh, there's something that Will Stansel wrote on ah, Twitter. Yes, I believe that I, uh, I thought was very notable. And I want to go over that. It's a, a, sure. a mini tweet storm, not that long. Yeah, one of the things I had too. So let's have you do it. Okay. One thing you see a lot on here is people pointing out the contradictions in the putative views of Trump's GOP. COVID's a Chinese plot, but also a hoax. The right. insurrection was uh, Antifa, but also a tour of patriots. Yes. And what people need to understand is that these contradictions aren't a symptom of Trumpism. They point to its core, the emotional, psychological appeal to millions of America, the Amer Americans, I think he meant. The ability to sustain these contradictions is why Trump was elected and how this movement exists, because ultimately what Trump offers, what fascism offers, is a philosophy of total emotional and psychological indulgence. Believe whatever makes you feel best. Live your politics uh, the way you, you want know. to live your politics. You don't yes. want to take credit for the insurrection, but want to claim it's dead as your martyrs. How could you have martyrs if there wasn't an insurrection? Well, go ahead. Just say it. Yeah. The Capitol was attacked sense, by Antifa, but... but Ashley Babbitt was a hero. Okay. Hey, yeah. China, but annoyed by the scolding liberals in their masks, call the coronavirus a democratic hoax, but also a deadly foreign bioweapon. <laughs> and what a weapon. Right. Uh, voters aren't drawn to Trump's politics because of a specific policy view or ideology. They're drawn to him because those politics say, think whatever's easiest, indulge your laziest ideas, your basest prejudices. There are no rules except one. You have to support Trump. Yeah. You cannot abandon the leader. Support for the leader absolves you of the burden of rationality and the sin of inconsistency. Prove your faith. And that's why Trumpism and fascism reliably attract the worst and the weakest, the dumb, the selfish, the cowardly. That's how you get Matt Getz and Marjorie Taylor Greene. Yes. It's an endlessly flexible vessel for the worst vices, willing to forgive anything and let them do anything in exchange for loyalty to the strong man. And the mistake American political thinkers keep making is trying to link Trump to pre-existing ideology. Well, he's just a conventional Republican except for X, Y, and Z. Hmm. Trump doesn't have an ideology. Right. Okay. You, Stancil says you can't understand Trump's rise without looking at the deeper psychological appeal. That's his promise to voters. That's why nothing his movement says or believes makes sense and nobody seems to care. It's also why you can't triangulate or maneuver his supporters away. They don't really want any of what we're offering anyway. They want the freedom to do and think whatever they feel at the moment, something no liberal of any description could ever promise them. Hmm. So you're not going to win over those voters ever. We know that. That's why you have to outvote them. But you can't uh, uh, spend your time attracting them. The argument we always have is how many of them, you know, what's the percentage of the Republican Party who's like that? Yes. Okay. Uh, and we're talking about the pop general population. We're talking about anywhere between 16 and 23 percent. Why did they pick 23? Because that's the group that didn't want Nixon to resign when he resigned. Mm. There's always going to be some core group. It, it, it's in the range of what George Wallace got when he ran. 11 percent. Oh, Yeah. You know, so somewhere there between 11 and 23 percent, depending upon the issue and what's going on, 11 percent in good times and 23 percent in bad times, uh, you know, they're going to go with uh, fascism. That's always a, a undercurrent here in the U.S. 
the upsetting and worrying thing is when it turns out that it's more than that. Yeah. More than 23%, not much more. Because remember, half the country doesn't vote. Right, that's true. So, uh, you know, you get it up to 26%, you can win elections. Uh, yeah, it's possible. And especially if people continue to not vote and just yeah, say, like well, hey, college, things suck, so but... so forth. You know, so it's a large enough group to be worried about and very concerned about. But at the same time, it's not that large a group when you're looking at the overall country. So, you know, the, the thing is to motivate everybody else. Yeah. And the things that mm-hmm. motivate you to be lazy and hateful are powerful motivators. So you got to come up with stuff on the other side to motivate your voters if you really want to outvote them. Yes. And those are, but the, yeah, I don't know and if there is anything happens. quite as you powerful. Know, Obama did that in 2008 because he was unique and it seemed like a great experience. And besides, mm-hmm. uh, there was the Great Recession and he had, uh, you know, some hope to get out of it. So that was motivating. It's yes. difficult to duplicate and it's especially difficult to duplicate uh, with uh, low propensity voters, although mm-hmm. uh, uh, people did because the turnout this past time uh, was actually pretty decent. So decent it's starting to worry Republicans. And so they're doing Texas style stuff. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, yeah. That's the only way they can uh, increase their odds of winning with that small group of people. But it is incredibly powerful. And uh, it occurs to me now, I guess we've described it. It's, it's what we call gimmitarianism. Yep. Uh, it's That's what you call you your do, term. Yeah, good. do whatever you want. I mean, hold whatever positions you want. If they change tomorrow, if they change in five minutes, if they change in this sentence, it's okay. Don't worry right. about it. What's the difference? Some egghead so, is going to tell you you don't make sense. Who cares? So here's a piece I just came across in that regard uh, from Indie Week huh. called The Elephants in the Room, How the GOP Lost Its Way by Howell Crowther. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Indie Week. Uh, and he talks about... Uh, it was Indie uh, Week. One, one uh, particular analysis by David Brooks and others who have uh, uh, looked at this. Uh, so David Brooks asks us, why did the Democratic candidates pretend to be smarter than they really are while the Republicans pretend to be dumber? Oh, are they... Is this all pretend? Uh, I don't know. Okay. This was... Uh, uh, to answer Brooks as if he didn't know is condescending. So we assume his question is rhetorical, but the media have become a bubble where the people inside don't always grasp what's obvious to everybody outside. What Brooks probably knows, he will never write. Democrats pretend to be as smart as they can because they think many of their target voters are intelligent and discriminating. And Republicans mm-hmm. pretend to be as dumb as they can because they think most of their base is even dumber. Wow. All right. This humorously sorry spade of the party, the wages of four decades of cynical success was pulled in focus by a Times headline from the Republican primary camps in New Hampshire. Candidates spar over who's a real Republican. Hmm. Right. And they can spar, says this author, until Jesse Helms endorses Barack Obama. But the real Republican will never emerge from this pack or any other in its pursuit of power. The Republican Party has dismembered and reassembled itself. So a thousand livid sutures are showing. It's not a party. It's a Frankenstein monster. Patched together from dead and discontinued materials, organ transplants, rough pieces that look familiar but never match. Since the party symbol is the elephant, the parable of the blind man and the elephant is relevant. Touch the thing here, it's a briefcase. Over there, it's a cross. Down there, it's a bomb. Gasoline pump, pistol, golf club. Maybe a noose. (laughs) Republicans are no longer a party, but a loose coalition of Americans who hate things different things, uh, praying that fear and aversion can win them another four years of power in excess. Uh, I have to see when this article was written, but uh, February 13th, 2008. And boy, is it relevant. Ooh. Wow. OK, that's something that I did not anticipate. Yeah. How did so, you find uh, it? yeah, this guy saw it coming. Yeah. How'd you find that? Uh, I don't know. I was looking up uh, Will Stansel stuff and this just oh. popped up. Somebody had said, hey, take a look at this in regard to that. OK. And yeah, 2008. That's pretty remarkable. Yep. Wow. OK. Uh, scary. And nothing in it is wrong. No. Including his observation about David Brooks. That seems to be right, too. Mm-hmm. Very odd. So, pretty good. So this was 15 years ago. Yeah. The bottom, down at the bottom, the uh, photo uh, displayed at the bottom is uh, people with Fred Thompson signs. <laughs> Give you oh, an yeah. idea of how old this is. Fred, Fred oh, Remember Fred Thompson? <laughs> yeah. What a powerhouse. Just wait until he declares. Right. Oh, my gosh. Anyway, uh, wow, what a weird thing. And then, ah, oh, well, well, maybe we're sunk. Who knows? 
Yeah, who knows? Okay. Anyway, uh, I thought find. it was going to be relatively brief. Of course, I thought it was going to be an hour ago, but right. that's my piece for today. Okay. And, uh, you know, we'll be back on Wednesday, computer willing. Yeah, I hope so. Remember how to zap all the things. Yep. Okay. I'm glad but you made it here. That's the important thing. Yeah. All right. So. so take care and, uh, you know, have a uh, great uh, long weekend uh, and remember what Not it's so for. Not so though. Yeah. Okay. I mean, don't be happy. Uh, but still have a great <laughs> long weekend. <folks. laughs> All right. Fair enough. I, I thought it was a faux outrage anyhow. Good. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. Take care and uh, enjoy your Tuesday and hope everything works for you on Wednesday. All yep. right. Very good, and uh, I don't know. Now we're stuck. Now we have nothing left to use up all the good stuff. Uh, there, well, uh, we did at least get to one of the threads. Uh, I had that Will Stansel thing parked as well, so that made a good transition. We covered some of that, even though I ended up getting stuck in that uh, story about vaccine tourism. But we made the, the point that was necessary in that one uh, to raise questions about what does it mean for Florida to say they have vaccinated X amount of people if it turns out that they are a major hub for vaccine tourism? Which, again, I, I don't necessarily think is all that bad, though there are very troubling aspects to it, no doubt. And not the preferred way of giving out the vaccine, either domestically or internationally. But the idea that... Uh, Florida gives out so many of these shots, although they do they point out that there are other destinations for this, including the mention of Las Vegas. And here in this next paragraph, if we picked up where we left off, it says that uh, local officials in New York and Alaska actively encourage vaccination tourism. I guess it makes a little well, you know, New York is a destination you'd probably maybe go to anyway for various other reasons. Alaska great tourism spot although i wonder what kind of tourism trade they do among latin and south americans it's a long haul but hey i guess if you're going up to get a shot anyway uh i mean it's a great lure i think quite honestly is not a bad idea just i guess i'll categorize it with the covid vaccination lotteries like whatever it takes to get people vaccinated i suppose and if they're going to if they're determined the w wealthy Central and South Americans are determined to use their wealth and privilege to come here and get a shot. Well, you know, I guess ring a couple extra tourism dollars out of them as well along the way. And uh, why not? But yeah, le it leaves real questions. If a significant portion, and I think it's probably more significant portion in Florida than New York or Las Vegas or Alaska that have been injected into vaccine tourists, then it raises questions. What does it mean when Florida says we have uh, vaccinated X million people if it's not necessarily the case that they have vaccinated that percentage of Florida residents? I guess that explains a high vaccination rate and a high circulation rate of the virus uh, alongside, of course, things like uh, doing away with mask mandates early um, also, Ron DeSantis over the weekend making a show of uh, his, let's see, he has, uh, you know, signed legislation banning localities from reimposing any additional mask mandates or, or requirements. Uh, likewise, he has now threatened, I don't know whether he has legislation in pocket or an executive order in mind, threatening the cruise industry which has been saying we will require passengers to show proof of vaccination before boarding, which makes sense because, well, in some sense, right? As somebody on Twitter said, whoever heard of people uh, getting sick en masse uh, on a cruise ship, right? That never happens. I mean, that's where this whole thing started for Americans anyway. Um, but... Uh, it, the, the cruise industry, in an attempt to reopen, I mean, I assume they were devastated during the pandemic, but in an attempt to lure people back on, are going to try and make it safe for them and say, well, you can only get on the cruise ship if you've been vaccinated, therefore, it should be a relatively safe place to be. But 
because Ron DeSantis has hitched his wagon to the Trump mobile, if you will, uh, he says, well, you know, we're still we, we still stand by the assertion and it doesn't make any difference whether it's logical or not, that this whole thing is either a hoax or a bioweapon or people who aren't vaccinated are going to be treated like second class citizens like Marjorie Tr- Trader Green says or whatever. And so he says, I will the state of Florida will fine cruise lines five thousand dollars. Every time they demand vaccine proof from one of their passengers. And of course, plenty of people, well, you know, big industry in Florida going cruising, particularly in the Caribbean, from Florida ports. And they may have the cruise ships over a barrel and that uh, it, it, would be a, it would be a major undertaking to uh, shift their boarding of passengers to somewhere else if DeSantis actually has the power to do this. And it may be the case that DeSantis threatens to impose these fines or maybe even does impose these fines. And I don't know whether they get paid, but they get appealed at some point. And it may be the case that the cruise lines eventually win. But I guess just another one of those things where you say, what happened to these Republicans? It used to be the case, you know, if if Democrats ever did anything that threatened the cruise industry in Washington, it would be a huge attack point. But again, Will Stansel reminds us there's no point in trying to hang them out to dry for their hypocrisy. They don't it doesn't register with them and their ideology isn't about being logical or consistent. It's about the opposite. I want to believe that this is standing up for America, that this doesn't hurt things. And if it does, it's still Democrats fault. And that doesn't make any sense. And I don't care Screw you all. I'm owning the libs by destroying the cruise industry. But that doesn't destroy, you know, that doesn't own libs. It's a very conservative. It doesn't matter. I don't care. But it shoots yourself in the foot. It it ruins, undermines your own base of political power. No, it doesn't. Who cares, even if it does? All right. I mean, there's really not very many ways of dealing with that. Uh, But anyway, the takeaway I, I was most interested in from the vaccine tourism one was the question my wife had. How how well is Florida doing if they can't tell who they put those shots into? And does it make any sense to say that Florida is X percent vaccinated when it may very well be the case that they're not and not even nearly that vaccinated if vaccine tourism has been a major force there? All right. Let's see. Other things that I wanted to share with everybody. I'm going to thumb through the uh, uh, the the pocket archives here. Actually, we're so close to the end of the show that we're not going to be able to get through most of these things anyway. But plenty of fodder for the rest of the week. Maybe one last thing I'll throw in there just to illustrate the point, I guess, that Will Stansel was making. A very true, very solidly built a uh, tweet here from Kasim Rashid, who uh, has got a very big following on Twitter and is a blue checkmark kind of person as a result, perhaps, pointing out, you know, with uh, uh, the same surprise the rest of us have, Trump, uh, the, the Memorial Day flap over the Kamala Harris tweet, for instance, doesn't have to make any sense, right? Trump has been horrible on Twitter and elsewhere about the, the exact same issue and has never called out on it, right? Trump saying, I got five deferments because of my rich dad, didn't go to Vietnam. Republican shrug. It's even got the little, the old shrug emoji thing, right? Uh, Trump uh, escaping STDs was my Vietnam. Big shrug. Mocking gold star parents. Shrug. Fallen soldiers are suckers and losers. Shrug. And uh, Vice President Harris saying, have a good weekend. Republicans saying, this is outrageous. You know, does it make any sense? No, it doesn't. But that's actually part of the attraction for the Trumpiest Republicans. It doesn't make any sense and it drives liberals up the wall that it doesn't make any sense. And so therefore, it's even more exciting to simply say to hell with it. It doesn't matter to us that it doesn't make any sense. Trump, Trump, Trump. And that's all that we care about. And to the extent that it makes no sense and makes you angry, good. All right. Plenty to catch up on. Still left for the rest of the week. We'll want to talk a little bit about what's going on down in Texas and just how egregious that bill is. A lot of people observing over the weekend some of the 
worst examples of what's in that bill, including, uh, oh, let's see, there were all sorts of provisions in there, including the ability for Texas election judges to overturn the results of elections uh, without actually ever bothering to canvas the ballots and figure out what was the actual intention of the voters. Just things kind of look like fraud, so that'll be enough for us to overturn things. Plus all the regular stuff about uh, closing the polling places in heavily minority areas, etc., etc., the usual. But Texas Repub uh, Democrats in the state legislature staging one of those walkouts in order to block things. But as Greg mentioned, it sounds like the governor intends to call a special session and bring the thing back. But at least the secrecy is blown up. That's the good news about these things. We'll concentrate on that and much more tomorrow. Uh, if she can remember that it's Tuesday and not Monday, we'll ha hear from Joan McCarter and we'll catch up with her on all the exciting developments and talk a little bit about that weird filibuster move we might be able to pull from one day. NetworksRadio.com you have been listening to k -Grow in the Morning with David Waldman. All right, Justice Putnam is up next with the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. He's got a uh, collection of stories from around the country and around the world from over the weekend as well, including Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg now having to speak out publicly to urge travelers to respect mask mandates and stop, please, beating the crap out of crew members. Won't you please? That's next.